Okay, thank you for, uh, for still being here on Friday. I've been instructed to hold the book up again, and I have nothing clever to say this time, except, let's see, if you buy it now, you don't have to pay shipping. <laughs> and the less you pay for a book, the better you feel about it, right? Okay, so <laughs> go, go buy the book and... Or don't. Um, I'm saying Friday afternoon. I, um, the, the first place I preached regularly, I've had a lot of fun tell, telling you about this place, was Harmony Mountain when I was a student at Harding. I would drive out to Harmony Mountain and preach. And there were only like 15 you know, people present. And there was this one family, they would take me to lunch every, um, every, every day. It was, it was really great. And I've, I've developed you know, great affection for those people who let me practice on them because you, you can just imagine how awful the preaching uh, was and uh, but the, the, the woman uh, you know the family I would eat lunch with every day uh, she would fall asleep in church every single Sunday there was never a Sunday when she didn't fall asleep and it wouldn't have been so bad if she had just fallen asleep like most people do but instead her eyes would be open and her eyes would roll up into her head and, you know, it was like preaching to zombie. <laughs> so if you feel like that, just lay your head down and, and uh, don't, don't do the zombie thing uh, on me. Um, okay, so we have this picture in our mind uh, of a teenager who is practicing the violin. And uh, this teenager is in the state orchestra. And like all good uh, orchestra directors, his director is a tyrant. And they have had trouble uh, playing the music, and so he sent them all home to practice on the toughest licks. And uh, he's, he's practicing those, and what you have to do is you have to record your playing of that particular passage and hand it in for a grade. And so he's playing. And um, let's see, how, how do we appreciate this? Uh, uh, how many of you have actually had the experience of preparing a document on a typewriter? <laughs> okay. You remember how frustrating that used to be? I remember when I first got a computer, my frustration was uh, I would put the white out on the screen and it wouldn't do anything. <laughs> you know, you ever do a term paper in one of those things and you get to the end and you've got the footnotes fouled up and you have to tear up the page and start again? So. I mean, people should even get credit for producing documents today on the, on, on the computer. I mean, it's just, what a bunch of wusses. Um, <laughs> and what's fascinating is even with spell check, there's still all sorts of spelling uh, errors. Uh, although texting has something to do with that. U does have three letters in the... Uh, most English dictionaries. Uh, and so like you on the typewriter, he's, he's playing those, those difficult passages, and this time he almost gets it, but right at the end, he messes it up. And so he turns off the recording, and he starts again. And this time he's only three or four measures in, and he messes up, and he turns it off, and he tries again. And now it's midnight, and he's still trying to play that passage perfectly, and he's almost to the end, and he messes up, and tears are running down his eyes, and he howls in frustration, knowing he can't hand this in. And so he tries again. He plays, almost shaking now, gets to the end, got it, and hands it in. 
and gets a B minus. <laughs> and now imagine, there is a teenager playing his violin. And his mother comes in and says, do you have any idea what time it is? It's almost midnight. And uh, son, I don't mean to be unkind, but I don't really care for violin music in the middle of the day. <laughs> midnight, really mom? I had no idea. It was this late. But I got to do it one more time. Sit, listen. And he plays. And his eyes are closed. And like the first boy, tears are running down his eyes. Because of the beauty of this music. And he hits a glitch. He goes, mm, and keeps playing. Gets to the end. Looks at his mother with a wry smile and says, you know, even with my mess ups, it's beautiful, isn't it? And she says, yeah, it's beautiful. Shining the light in the shadows. Same picture. Teenager at midnight playing the violin. Tears running down their, street, their cheeks. But the pictures feel so different. As the first tries to reach a level of perfection that constantly eludes him and he howls in frustration. And even when he's done his best, it's never good enough. And the other who has no idea what time it is because he plays for the love of the music. Totally different impressions from remarkably similar scenes. Um, it should be obvious to you that I'm doing theology here. And I've shined the light in a certain way on the first two days about the relentless work of God in Christ as the only power in the world that can beat back the chaos. But there is another side to this story. And it is the story of what happens to human beings who experience God's relentless grace. And the first picture is a picture of trying to earn God's approval or righteousness and making yourself absolutely crazy in the process. And the reason we feel that scene so keenly is because many of us have done it, howling in frustration, because we can't live into what we believe. And then the second picture, where we have heard the gracious call of God in Christ and His redemp uh, re relentless redemption power, and what we're doing now is just playing with God's cosmic music. For the love of the music. Midnight? Really? I hadn't noticed. Okay, now I'm going to do real theology. Um, it's, it's, really, it's, it's really interesting what stories do, isn't it? Um, um, one, of, one, of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite philosophical pieces in the history of modern philosophy is uh, a little piece by Judith Jarvis uh, Thompson, and I'm not going to tell you the name of the piece because that will immediately create a certain prejudice in you towards it. Uh, but she's got one of, the, she's got one of this, the greatest scenes in the history of philosophical literature, and it involves a violin. Um, she says, I want you to imagine that you wake up one morning and you find 
that your kind of adrenal system has been hooked up to a famous dying violinist. And this, uh, this violinist, his, his system isn't working, so they've hooked you up to your system so that your system can operate for him and for you. And they did this to you in the middle of the night. You were a sound sleeper. <laughs> and you say, well, this is outrageous. And you are told, I'm, I'm sorry that the Society of Music Lovers did this to you. But he's hooked up to you now. And if we unhook him, he'll die. And so you have to stay hooked up to him. Uh, but don't worry. Uh, it's only for nine months. In Judith Jarvis Thompson's famous article, A Defense of Abortion. Uh, where she raises the absolutely fascinating question of not when life begins, but how does a fetus acquire the rights to the mother's body? Because most of us would say, you're not obligated to be hooked up to this violinist. Uh, the question is not whether a violinist is a person. Uh, they're clearly not. Uh, <laughs> The question is, does the violinist have a right to your body or not? The question is not whether the fetus is a person. The question is, does the fetus have a right to the mother's body or not? The reason that's so brilliant is because it turns the camera lens and makes us look at the, the issue in a completely different way. And I won't steal from you the joy of reading to find out where that, that article uh, goes, but... Um, on an issue where the camera lens has always been focused on when does life begin, it's brilliant and it says, okay, what if you change the angle? Do you see anything that you didn't see before? And I'll tell you, my own prejudices, uh, the issue ceases then to be personhood. The issue becomes covenant, uh, which as a theologian is a far more interesting issue to me. Okay, so I, what I want to do is I want to hit you with uh, kind, of, kind of some different angles that theology looks at to talk about the atoning work of Christ. And then I'm going to return to those uh, little violin players. Uh, in, in the history of Christianity, there have been basically four theories of what we call atonement. Okay, so this is the serious historical part of our, of our lecture, and I remind you again, this is very expensive uh, information uh, that I'm dispensing. Uh, uh, the, the first, the earliest theory is what we call the th ransom theory of atonement. And it's all based basically on a story. And you and I will construct the story and we'll do it uh, very quickly. Okay, ransom theory, we've already got this picture in our mind, right? Mel Gibson's probably involved in it somehow. Okay. <laughs> Okay, that was my gratuitous pop culture uh, reference. Um, I haven't seen the movie, but I did my research. Okay. Uh, uh, one of my goals in life is to be able to talk about pop culture stuff without actually participating in any of it. Uh, uh, and so the ransom theory goes something like this. There is a kidnap victim. Guess who the kidnap victim is? You, okay, humankind is the kidnap victim. Uh, there is someone who is going to ransom us. Guess who's going to ransom us? God. <laughs> you didn't do that well on that one, okay. <laughs> God is going to pay a ransom price. Guess what the ransom price is going to be? Jesus, Jesus. all right, now we're cooking. God's going to pay the ransom. Jesus is going to be the ransom price. You are going to be the ones who are going to be ransomed. Who is the ransom going to be paid to? Ah, that's where the story starts to break down, right? Is God going to pay off Satan? That doesn't sound quite right. You know, God wants to just take Satan's stuff. You don't have to pay him off. Um, okay, so the, the story kind of works up to a point, and it's actually quite a powerful story, right? That God would, would use his own son as the ransom price to buy us back. That's as good as far as it goes, but then it gets sort of stuck. Which brings us to theory number two. 
uh, which took like a thousand years to develop. Um, but we're skipping that thousand years. Uh, lots of really interesting stuff happens in there, but uh, I don't have any idea what. Okay, so uh, um, I'm a theologian, not a historian. Um, Along comes um, theory number two. Uh, it comes from our good friend St. Anselm of Canterbury. And St. Anselm was way cool. Uh, he's, he is one of my favorite medieval theologians. Uh, actually, only two that I can name. Uh, 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 and of the two, I prefer uh, him. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, uh, Anselm comes up with the theory of atonement that you probably learned in church. Uh, okay, okay, so this is uh, really interesting. You get to play along here. Uh, he starts out uh, his uh, famous book, which, who, which title is in Latin. Uh, the English translation would be something like, uh, Why God Became Man, something like that. Um, and he starts out with this question. If God had wanted to redeem the world in some other way than the way that he did it, could he have done so? Everybody got the question? Because we're getting ready to vote. Okay. I'll give you a moment to think. Done? Okay. <laughs> the question is, could God have redeemed the world some other way than he did through um, the sacrifice of Jesus, his son. Those of you who say, yes, he could have done it some other way. Okay, those of you who say, no, there's no way he could have done it some other way. Okay, those of you who didn't vote for either. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I know, you gotta find out which way the wind's blowing, right, before you, <laughs> before you get committed. Those of you who've said, yes, God could have done it some other way, you said that because, look, God's God, right? He's, he's got infinitely resourceful. If he wanted to do it some other way, he could have. Anselm, though, disagrees with you. Anselm says, we know it could not have been done any other way because if it could have been done some other way, God would have done it that way. Thus, there must be something necessary about this because surely God is not going to sacrifice His own Son unless there's some overwhelming necessity about it. Now, you can, you can think that's right or wrong, but I'm, I'm tracking with Him, aren't you, so far? Okay, I get what He's doing. So now He's going to explain to us why it was absolutely necessary that it be done this way and this way alone. Uh, and it, it is all based on a futile... Uh, a kind of conception of honor and shame and, um, and lords and vassals. Okay, so God is the Lord, you're the vassal. And your sin has offended God's honor. This is sometimes called the honor of God theory. He is mightily and grossly offended by your sin against him because you are his vassals and you have no right to engage in this kind of sin. And like the feudal Lord would, God says, I demand satisfaction. Which is why this theory is sometimes not called the honor of God theory, but the satisfaction theory of atonement. Uh, I try to get my students to think, of, uh, although they don't watch many old movies, of, of the old uh, you know, movie when you have kind of this chivalry thing and somebody's honor has been offended and they go up to the person who's offended their honor, they get their gloves and they slap them across the face and say, I demand satisfaction. It's the picture Anselm creates. And so we have this problem here now. Uh, God demands satisfaction, and our sin has created this huge debt. In fact, the debt is so huge that only God could pay it. But the other side of the coin is God doesn't owe anything. The debt belongs to human beings. So God has the ability to pay, but no obligation. Human beings have the obligation to pay, but no ability. 
Thus, Anselm says, in one of the greatest moments in the history of Christian theology, what we have to have is a God-man. We have to have a God-man because as God, He has the ability, and as man, He has the obligation. And that's why God had to become man. So, Jesus Christ essentially takes our place. Uh, one way to think about it is if, uh, if, if somebody came in here uh, uh, with a gun and was uh, threatening to, to, to kill us all, and uh, I said, no, 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 no don't, 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 don't kill everybody. Don't, you know, don't, don't, kill, don't kill Travis. I'm, I'm particularly fond of Travis. I will take Travis's place. And the killer says, well, there's a problem with that. I said, what? He says, you can't take his place. I'm already going to kill you. <laughs> okay, so we're all under the death sentence. So the only one who can take our place is somebody who comes from the outside. Jesus takes our place. And as the God-man pays off our debt. Now, one of the things you will notice about this theory, it's brilliant and powerful and moving, but it's not like it doesn't have any problems. Now, you are at a little different age and place in life than my students are, but when I tell my students that story, their general reaction is this. Why doesn't God try to get over it? <laughs> that is, their impression is that God is peevish. I demand satisfaction. Which is to say, we don't exactly live in that sort of honor and shame, feudal world where that makes really good sense. Uh, and you may have also noticed, unlike the ransom theory, that Satan is nowhere in sight here. You know, Satan's got nothing to do with this. This is all a transaction within the person of God. God essentially has to find some way to uh, compensate for his own offended honor. Theory number three. Uh, there's a guy who's basically a contemporary of Anselm, although he's a bit younger. Uh, and uh, his name is Abelard. Uh, and Abelard is also one of my favorite medieval uh, theologians. Actually, it occurs to me now that there are three that, that I know. Uh, the third being Thomas Aquinas. Uh, and to read Thomas Aquinas is to have all of your worst nightmares about theology brought to bear. Uh, now, now, Abelard, he is, uh, he's way cool. Um, you're you're going to like Abelard. A Abelard uh, took great delight in just sort of uh, being obnoxious. Uh, so he wrote this book uh, called Sic et Non. That's your Latin. Uh, yes and no. And what the book was is basically a collection of all the things that popes had said through the years that disagreed with each other. <laughs> so without writing any commentary, he would just say, the pope said this here, and the pope said this here, he said yes here, he said no here, and they're both speaking now by the absolute authority of God. Now isn't that interesting? <laughs> Don't you like him? Uh, uh, okay. I like him. Abelard's story is a little tragic. This actually has nothing to do with the theology, but when you're talking about Abelard, who can resist the story? Uh, Abelard had a famous student named Eloise. And uh, Abelard's brothers had some notion that there was more going on between Abelard and Eloise than theology. So they did what any brothers would do in this situation, uh, they broke in one night and castrated him. I know, I think it's an overreaction myself, but... Uh, <clears throat> but it was a different time. So, off to the monastery for Abelard. 
off to the nunnery for Heloise. And Abelard and Heloise exchange letters the rest of their lives, and they become some of the greatest love literature in the history of the Western world, the letters of Abelard and Heloise. And, you know, if, if you're courting somebody and need something, I would suggest that you, you go take a look. It's, <laughs> it, it's, it's good stuff. Uh, if you can kind of forget the, the background. So anyway, <laughs> uh, but, 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 but I've, I've wandered off uh, from my tale. Um, um, so Abelard looks at this, this thing by, by Anselm and he says, that, that can't be right. This, this can't be God trying to kind of appease his own offended honor by, by offering his son. And so he gives us the third theory, which is often called the subjective theory of atonement. And what Abelard basically says is what this story is about is uh, the reaction that you get by the willingness of God to give any and everything for your sake. So what's really important is not kind of parsing what's going on in, in the person of God in the cross. What's important is how you respond or receive that. What it's really about is God appealing to you in love. It's about moving your emotions. Um, I, uh, I, I, I'm like many of you, I, I've seen uh, uh, The Passion of, of the Christ. It's not a movie I'm extremely fond of. I, I have seen it a couple of times, had different reasons. Uh, you know, it's, it's really interesting uh, how you receive a movie differently depending on who you're watching it with. Um, and I'm not, I'm not a big movie fan uh, uh, anyway, I do, I do try to go a couple of times a year just to see what it's about. Um, but anyway, I, I, I go to see uh, The Passion of the Christ the first time, just to see it. And uh, there are several church groups there when I'm there. And uh, uh, you, know, you, may, you may remember this, this, this flogging scene that just goes on interminably. Uh, I sort of agree with the movie critic who said the movie was mis misnamed. It should have been named Jesus Christ Chainsaw Massacre. Uh, and when I saw it the first time, this is a church group, there's this one sister who uh, every time uh, the whip lands, she yells out, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Abelard. It's all about what's going on in my heart as I see the work of God in Christ. When I went to see it the second time, I, I went because uh, one of my uh, pagan friends wanted to go. And I got to have pagan friends. I, uh, and, uh, I, I mean, it, it really is, doesn't, doesn't know very much at all about, about religion or Christianity, but he, he was a movie buff. So I said, okay, well, here we go. So uh, we go, and I have no idea how he's reacting to this. Uh, and so we get out of the movie, and uh, I said, well, what'd you think? And uh, he says to me, now, you have to remember this is a quote. Okay, I'm quoting somebody else. <laughs> what the hell was that? <laughs> By the way, a most excellent question to begin a really good discussion. Uh, not thank you, Jesus, but... What the hell was that? Okay. 
what Abelard is saying, this story is all about what's going on in the heart and, and mind of the receiver. Everybody with me? Okay. Uh, theory number four, uh, which has uh, the unfortunate name of uh, Christus Victor, uh, which is a kind of a fancy way of saying Christ the Victor. Uh, and the reason we don't just say Christ the Victor is, is so that we can uh, intimidate uh, others. Um, Christ the Victor is actually a return uh, in a more sophisticated way to the old ransom theory. Uh, and what it pictures the cross about is a cosmic battle between God and Satan. And Jesus going to the cross is not so much about something going on in God's eternal relationship. It's not so much about God's offended honor. It is about Satan's bold, relentless desire to encapsulate the world in chaos. And so he unleashes all of his power. And for a moment, darkness comes over the face of the earth. But Christus Victor talks not just about the cross, but the resurrection. And it says, when Satan has done his worst, when all the powers of darkness and death and despair and disease have done their worst, God has the last word, and that word is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Christ the victor which is altogether different than Anselm, where Satan is nowhere in sight. Uh, now we're understanding what's going on is not so much the wrath of God. What's going on here is the power of Satan, which is serious and substantial, but no, uh, no match for the power of God. Um, my friend Billy Wilson says it this way, you know, if you watch the Passion of the Christ, you see the bloody, beat up Jesus, and he says, Yeah, but you should see the other guy. <laughs> the other guy is the one who really takes the pounding. Okay, now, which one of those is right? My guess is what you want to say is. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, each one of those shines the spotlight in a certain way, and each one puts certain things in shadows. Uh, and I, 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 I really believe if you just take one of those at the sacrifice of all the three, um, you're not seeing everything there is to see. You have to... You have to shine the light in different places to see those, uh, those different images. Um, some focus on what God is doing in Christ, uh, which uh, is what I've talked about the last two days. And one, poor Abelard, talks about what is happening in you. And I don't want Abelard's theory to be the only theory I have, but I want to have it. Because a central part of the Christian gospel is not just the story of the atonement, it is the continuing work of God in Christ in us. That it leads us to newness of life, to new creation, to new ways of being in the world. Um, let me uh, hit you with some uh, text since all I've been doing is formless theology. In Galatians chapter 5, and I, I don't quite have time to lay out all I think is going on in Galatians, and I would be incompetent to do that anyway. Uh, but the discussion in Galatians is basically about what are the identifying markers of being in Christ. Um, and uh, Paul is rejecting certain particularly Jewish rituals as identity markers for being in Christ. 
He's not saying they're bad things. He's just saying they cannot be boundary markers. Um, and I will resist the almost overwhelming temptation to just warn about setting boundary markers that God has not set. And so we have, we have these boundary markers that have been set, and Paul is all upset about it. Um, he's so upset about it uh, in verse 12 of chapter 5, the most famous line in the book. If you keep on, no, uh, let's see, verse 12. As for those agitators, I wish they would go all the way and emasculate themselves. As long as they're going to teach circumcision, I wish they'd just keep on cutting. <laughs> Which for some reason makes me think of Abelard. Uh, okay, so, so Paul is fairly fired up about this. Uh, but since we have continued to read Galatians through a dominantly Lutheran point of view, we have made Paul wind up to sound like he is anti-law or anti-ethics. And he is no such thing. What he's concerned about is people drawing lines of boundaries being in Christ that don't exist. It's all about faith in Jesus Christ. But he gets down to verse 16 after he's kind of gone off on them and he says, So I say, live by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature, for the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. Oh, the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. They're so obvious, I'm going to skip them. <laughs> Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. And now I'm back to my violin players. One of whom is trying desperately to get it right crying and howling in frustration of never getting it right. And even when he thinks he's gotten it right, B minus. Very akin to Paul's vision of what it means to try to be righteous under law. And then, our violin player, who has heard the wondrous music of the atoning work of Christ, who's heard the story that, that God so loves you that He would give His own Son as the ultimate ransom to redeem you back, never mind who He's paying it to. And the wondrous story that of all the ways uh, that, that God could redeem humanity, when you count all those ways up, it consists of a list of one. There's only one way. The need for a God-man. And God is such that that one way He is willing to do at enormous cost to Himself. And He's heard the story of God's appeal to us in deep relentless love and he's heard the story that God has overcome all the powers of darkness in Jesus Christ and so he plays. He plays out a response to this wondrous music not for a grade but because it is so beautiful. Um, I was thinking a bit about uh, about, about Rubel's sermon uh, 
and, and this frequent accusation that uh, if you preach grace, uh, you, you'll wind up with sloppy behavior. And uh, I, won't, I won't say that never happens. Uh, but the people I know who have really heard the story of God's grace uh, do things beyond anything that I ever do. Their response to the music is so far beyond anything that a legalist like I would do. Uh, they're not talking about how little they can do. They're saying, is it really midnight? I didn't notice. Isn't this music beautiful? Even with my mess-ups? To which God replies, yeah, son, it's beautiful. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and world without end. Amen.